Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Uh, uh, the the um, GRIPS program is an extraordinary one, I think, for the students who are lucky enough to join it. I think it's a tremendous preparation for public service in any country in the world. The facilities available here far outstrip what most public policy schools can offer in the United States, in Britain, in my own country, Canada. And so for those who have come here to study independently or on behalf of governments that uh, they belong to, I think you're exceptionally uh, fortunate. And I think uh, Japan is quite visionary to have created this extraordinary institute in Tokyo. I wish I had had access to an institute like this, instead of which I studied uh, public policy in the United States in ways that I think were probably much less interesting than what you experience here. Uh, my topic may be of some interest to Japanese members of the audience because Japan has very often been a member of the Security Council, but also because it is running for election again to the Security Council in uh, 2015, I think it is. And uh, it's not just getting elected to the Security Council that matters. In many ways, that's the easiest part of uh, the game. Much harder is to have a program of action. What are you going to do once you get into the Security Council? How are you going to make your mark? A permanent member, one of the P5 so-called, uh, Britain, China, France, uh, Russia, the United States, they don't have to worry about making their mark. They're there all the time and they dominate the institution. But for the elected members of the council, it's an opportunity that doesn't come every year and once elected, they seek to make their mark and uh, different countries do so in different ways, and I'm going to be very interested in seeing how Japan seeks to make its mark this time. Uh, you've all in mind some of the history that has been important for the Security Council. Uh, early on, the crisis in Kashmir, for example, then the Korean crisis uh, of the early 1950s the Suez crisis in the Middle East in 1956, the Congo crisis in the early 1960s, and some more Middle East crises, the Six-Day War, the Yom Kippur War, and so on. Uh, but actually, my story starts in 1986. What happened in 1986? Nothing that looked very interesting at the time, but it turned out to be important. In 1986, the term of office of the UN Secretary General, Javier Perez de Cuellar, a Peruvian uh, gentleman, much underestimated actually because he was an excellent Secretary General, was ending. And uh, secretaries general are elected by the General Assembly, but further to a recommendation by the Security Council. As I mentioned, the permanent members completely dominate the Security Council, so uh, these decisions they tend to regard as their own. They met quietly in the apartment of one of the ambassadors away from the UN so that nobody would know that they were meeting. And uh, they had no trouble agreeing on the re-election of Javier Perez de Cuellar, who was duly re-elected. But something had occurred during 1986 that was quite interesting for the permanent members. The new uh, leader of the Soviet Union, uh, Mr. Gorbachev, uh, 
had started publishing articles uh, in the leading Russian newspapers arguing that the Cold War should come to an end and that the Cold War could easily be ended by giving the United Nations a prominent role in settling the conflicts which were essentially the wreckage of the Cold War. Conflicts in uh, Southeast Asia and in Indochina, conflicts in the Horn of Africa and Southern Africa, conflicts in Central America. And when these articles were published in the West, perhaps in Japan, I don't know, they were dismissed as propaganda from Moscow. It's quite interesting when you look back at how the New York Times and other Western papers dealt with these uh, uh, pronouncements of Mr. Gorbachev. They were simply dismissed and disbelieved. Paris de Cuellar, interestingly, sensed an opportunity. And after he was reelected in a very unique way for a secretary general, he turned round and addressed very clearly the permanent five members of the council and said, you have been in dereliction of your duty. You have allowed the Iran-Iraq war a very murderous war, to go on for six years. Why haven't you stopped it? Now you stop it. And the permanent five were, first of all, very offended to be spoken to in this tone by a secretary general. Secondly, weren't certain at first that they would be able to agree on any strategy to uh, end the Iran-Iraq war but they decided to start meeting regularly in the apartments of the, their ambassadors to the UN, away from the UN, uh, and nobody knew this was going on. They met for three months. After three months, they had a strategy to end the Iran-Iraq war. It was agreed amongst the five of them. It took them two more months to convince the elected members of the council that this strategy was a good idea. Elected members had some uh, uh, amendments of their own to suggest, mostly good ideas. These were incorporated. And in uh, June of 1987, the council adopted a resolution outlining this strategy and calling for an immediate ceasefire. Iran and Iraq were surprised because the council had essentially been passive on their uh, conflict uh, since it broke out. And each side believed it had a strategic advantage in the uh, conflict. Neither side was ready to stop because they had the delusion that they could still win. Another year passed before they both accepted the resolution, a year that was particularly murderous, in which a particularly large number of Iranians and Iraqis were killed without any advantage becoming obvious for either of the parties. Once they accepted the resolution, the end of the war came very quickly. The resolution foresaw the deployment of a small UN observer mission to certify that the terms of the resolution were being met by both sides. The terms of the resolution were met by both sides and by 1989 that observer mission was already uh, winding down. Why this history? It's important because it was the first time the Permanent Five worked together constructively on something not central to their own interests and in line with the type of responsibility that the UN Charter gave the Permanent Five. And the Five were actually surprised and happy that they discovered they could work with each other thanks to this change in Russian policy, which was genuine. It turned out not to be propaganda. Mr. Uh, Gorbachev turned out to be quite sincere.
Uh, and from that early experience with uh, Iran and Iraq, the Security Council was able to help settle uh, conflicts in southwest Africa, usher in the independence of Namibia, uh, settle the particularly murderous uh, civil war, drawing in outside parties in Cambodia, help settle the interlocking wars of Central America, and uh, so on. So it was the Iran-Iraq war that introduced, and its end, that introduced the era of cooperation amongst the permanent five. Now, uh, the media much prefers conflict to cooperation. So the media, not surprisingly, uh, focuses on uh, relations between the permanent five when they disagree, particularly when they disagree strongly, as they do at the moment on Syria. But the media tends not to notice the 90% of the Security Council agenda on which the Permanent Five are able to agree, including recently uh, Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, where um, uh, the Security Council enforced the outcome of an election that the sitting president refused to recognize. That sitting president now is in some difficulty with the International Criminal Court in The Hague. So the Permanent Five routinely cooperate, although they always have their differences, in addressing uh, security threats and uh, challenges around the world, but they do have occasionally very significant differences, and we'll come back to that. But the single most important change in the Council's history occurred around 1986-87 when they discovered that after the Cold War they could cooperate on most international issues. And that continues until today. Uh, this sense of cooperation uh, amongst the five uh, deepened with the agreement of the Council to endorse quite strong measures to eject Saddam Hussein's Iraqi army from Kuwait uh, through uh, incremental strategy in 1990 and 1991. Uh, and the Security Council then for a number of years became very interventionist, particularly uh, you will remember in northern Iraq, in the Balkan uh, countries, in Somalia, and in a number of other uh, African conflicts. So now, to the heart of my talk, uh, I'm going to speak under three headings. First, what is substantively new in the Security Council since the end of the Cold War? Secondly, what are the driving considerations, the motivating factors that produce decisions of the Security Council that would not have occurred during the Cold War? Lastly, some institutional uh, factors that are new in the life of the Council. And finally, uh, I will have a conclusion which is a very personal one and which is highly debatable. So the single thing which is most important in what's new, I've already mentioned, the ability of the Permanent Five to cooperate. The second is part of a pattern of Security Council decisions. And that pattern is that the Council resorts much more often to the provisions of Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, which allows the Security Council to impose its decisions on any given country, all countries, groups within countries, groups of countries, and individuals in countries. 